Good day. Sharing to you today is Comprehensive Dangerous Drugs Act of 2002 under Republic Act number 9165 as amended. To start with, let's familiarize some terms. When we say administer, it refers to the act of introducing, okay, introducing any dangerous drug into the body of the person with or without her knowledge, either by injection, inhalation, ingestion, or other means, or of committing any act of indispensable assistance to a person in administering a dangerous drug to himself or herself, unless administered by a duly licensed practitioner for purposes of medication. In other words, in administering, it is not the person to whom the dangerous drug was introduced into the body that took the act of introducing the dangerous drug, but by someone to another person, either by injection, inhalation, ingestion, or other means. Chemical diversion. This is the technical term on the sale, distribution, supply, or transport of legitimately imported in transit, manufactured, or procured, controlled precursor, and essential chemical. Now, by the way, controlled precursors and essential chemical, if we are talking about the dangerous drugs, these are referring to the raw materials to be processed in the laboratory to come up with those um, combination of drugs. So these are the raw materials. In chemical diversion, it includes the sale, distribution, transportation, manufacture, procuring, either in diluted mixture or concentrated form to any person or entity in the manufacture of any dangerous drug and shall even include packaging, repackaging, labeling, relabeling, or concealment of such transaction through fraud, destruction of documents, fraudulent use of permits, misdeclaration, use of front companies, or mail fraud. So please take notice. On what constitutes diversion, it involves many overt acts as far as the perpetrators are concerned with respect to dangerous drugs. Clandestine laboratory. It is the facility or the place used for the illegal manufacture of dangerous drug and or controlled precursor and essential chemical. By the term itself, clandestine, it literally means secret, secret laboratory. So these are done in secrecy. Confirmatory test. An analytical test using a device, tool, or equipment with a different chemical or, or, or physical principle that is more specific, which will validate and confirm the result of the screening test. This test is significant on what we call the drug test. In the drug test, first test that a, a, a person shall undergo is what we call the screening test. It will give you either a negative or positive result as well as the kind of drug that was being used by the person. So that is the test. Now, to make one liable under Section 15 for using dangerous drug, it is not sufficient that he found positive during the screening test. It has to be confirmed. That's why you have their confirmatory test, meaning to say this validates, this confirms a positive result in a, in a screening test or the drug test of a person. Controlled precursor and essential chemical. So for you to be familiar with these chemicals, you can just Google the UN Convention Against Illicit Traffic in Narcotic 
and psychotropic substances, you can actually see the enumeration, a very long enumeration of what are considered to be controlled precursor and essential chemical. Dangerous drugs, you also have there another annex in the 1971 Single Convention on Psychotropic Substances. You can also see there in a long list of what is considered to be dangerous drug. The liver. When we say the liver, it refers to an act of knowingly passing a dangerous drug to another, personally, or by any means with or without consideration. Okay, that is the passing, knowingly passing a dangerous drug. Then dive or resort. It is refer it is referring to the place where any dangerous drug and or controlled precursor an essential chemical is administered, delivered, stored for illegal purposes, distributed, sold, or used in any form. Now, then dive or resort you have there a drug den, a drug dive, a drug resort. If that particular place is being used in administering, delivering, stored for illegal purposes, distributed, sold, or used in any form with respect to dangerous drug, and, on, and or controlled precursor and essential chemical. Now, I browse to one of my readings. I noticed that in another country, they have their the so-called drug hotel because the using the distribution, the administration of dangerous drug was done in a hotel. So it is a drug hotel. But for purposes of our jurisdiction, we only have the den, dive, or resort, unless such time that they also will resort to such kind of luxurious place, then we will have that drug hotel as well. But for as long as that place is used for illegal purposes as to the distribution or using of dangerous drug, then that is covered as well. Dispense. Is dispense the same as that of the liver? Now, dispense refer to the act of giving away, selling, or distributing medicine or any dangerous drug with or without the use of prescription. So, we can use properly this term as far as uh, drugs that were sold by the pharmacy from the uh, drugstore. So that is dispensing. Drug dependence. As based in the World Health Organization definition, it is a cluster of physiological, behavioral, and cognitive phenomena of variable intensity in which the use of psychoactive drugs takes on a high priority, thereby involving, among others, a strong desire or a sense of compulsion to take the substance and the difficulties in controlling substance-taking behavior in terms of its onset, termination, or levels of use. Now... Who does not use drugs here? Now take note, drugs, we are referring to medicine. And drugs for that matter, we have their regulated drug and the unregulated. We also have there the legal and the illegal ones. Just a simple cup syrup. If you do not follow the prescription of your doctor, if there is a need for you to take that, medicine or that drug sometimes if you did it in over the dosage requires or as needed by your body somewhat we can say that you are overdose of the drug we can we term it as drug dependence as well because if you notice or i think you have heard some overuse this kind of cup syrup to experience that high spirit taking in high dosage of this 
suppose legal ones hence you have their drug dependence but for purposes of RA 9165 the one being punished are the use of illegal drugs drug syndicate any organized group of two or more persons so meaning to say at least two forming or joining together with the intention of committing any offense prescribed under this act who is an employee of a den dive or resort the caretaker helper watchman lookout and other persons working in the den dive or resort employed by the maintainer owner and or operator where any dangerous drug and or controlled precursor and essential chemical is administered delivered distributed or used with or without compensation take note with or without compensation in connection with the operation thereof outside the definition of who an employee is of a den dive or resort if you knowingly went or visit a den dive or resort you are considered to be a visitor of a den dive or resort again other than what is being specifically considered to be an employee you are considered to be a visitor of a den dive or resort illegal trafficking in illegal trafficking of dangerous drug it refers to illegal cultivation, culture, delivery, administration, dispensation, manufacture, sale, trading, transportation, distribution, importation, exportation, and possession of any dangerous drug and or controlled precursor and essential chemical. So take note that the definition of illegal trafficking covers generally all the overt acts that you can think of as far as dangerous drugs is concerned. In manufacture, aside from production and preparation of any of the compound in the processing of any dangerous drug and or controlled precursor and essential chemical, directly or indirectly by extraction from the substances of natural origin, if it comes from drugs being cultivated, or planted, or independently by means of chemical synthesis, or by a combination of extraction and chemical synthesis, and shall include any packaging or repackaging of such substances. You also have there preparation, compounding, packaging, or labeling of a drug or other substances by a duly authorized practitioner as an incident of his or her administration or dispensation of such drug and or substance in the course of his or her professional practice, including research, teaching, and chemical analysis of dangerous drug and or substances that is not intended for sale or for any purpose. So in other words, 916 Web actually would tell us and would educate us that not all drugs are illegal. There are legal ones. It becomes illegal only because of the way others are using it with abuse. Sometimes, or we have to accept the fact that some of this dangerous drug per se also has some medical uses. Okay, it has medical uses. Take, for example, marijuana. In the Philippines, it is illegal, but in America, it is not. In fact, they have their medicinal marijuana. What else? Uh, you also have their dangerous drug that is used as tranquilizer, especially those who are um, cancer patients that had been in pain. So they are actually being, I think it's morphine. What else? So these dangerous drugs actually has some medical uses, only that it needs a prescription from a licensed or authorized practitioner 
so that he can give only enough dosage that your body needs because later we also have the return that if you if the the practitioner likewise give more than the dosage as needed by the body then that is an overt act punishable under the law so you have there the other name of marijuana so you have their cannabis you also have their injant him injan him now take note that marijuana as a plant it could be possible that you 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 use only the flowering tops but you also have there the leaves as well as the seeds okay in any nature whether it is dried or fresh okay the the flowering flowering or fruiting tops or any portion of the plant or seeds you also have there the resin, the extract, the tincture in any form whatsoever that is illegal under the Philippines. Are you also familiar or have you encountered CBD? Now, while CBD is uh, legal in America, in fact, it is put in some of the oils from a, a well-known company that is also engaged into business in the Philippines. Now, the... Philippine clients are not actually allowed to purchase it because, of course, if you will purchase it, you will be prosecuted under the Philippine laws. MDMA, so you have their very hard scientific name, but that is the ecstasy. So it refers to the drug having such chemical composition, including any of its isomers or derivatives in any form so you knew this to be a uh, as a, a party drug you have the shabu or the methamphetamine hydrochloride also known as ice myth or by any other name it refers to the drug having such chemical composition including any of its isomers or derivatives in any form. So this is what is very common in our country up to the present. So aside from marijuana, you have their shabu. Opium. And then you have there the opium poppy. That is also illegal in our country. So just like the marijuana, so this opium poppy, it's also a plant wherein any of the part of the plant is being used and that is illegal in the Philippines. Planting of evidence. This is referring to the willful act by any person of maliciously and surreptitiously inserting placing other or attaching directly or indirectly through any overt or covert act whatever quantity of any dangerous drug and or controlled precursor and essential chemical in the person, house, effects, or in the immediate vicinity of an innocent individual for the purpose of implicating, incriminating, or imputing the commission of any violation of this act. So basically, you incriminate an innocent person for the commission of any of the acts punished under the law. So that is planting of evidence. Pusher. Who is a pusher? Any person who sells, trades, administers, dispenses, delivers, or gives away to another or any terms whatsoever or distributes, dispatches, in transit or transports dangerous drug or who acts as a broker in any of such transaction in violation of this act. So you call him as a drug pusher. The screening, the screening test, I've mentioned this earlier. So you have there the rapid test performed to establish potential or presumptive positive result. Then it will be confirmed through a confirmatory test. Sell 
any act of giving away dangerous drug and a controlled precursor and essential chemical, whether for money or for any other consideration. How about trading? It involves the illegal trafficking of dangerous drug and a controlled precursor and essential chemical using electronic devices, but not limited to text, messaging, email, mobile, landlines, two-way radios, internet, instant messengers, and chat rooms, or acting as a broker in any such transaction, whether for money or other considerations. So meaning to say, you are trading this illegal drug in any form. Use use here the act of injecting intravenously or intramuscularly or it may also involve consuming either chewing the dangerous drug, smoking or sniffing the dangerous drug. You also have their eating, swallowing, or drinking or otherwise introducing into the physiological system of the body and of the dangerous drug. So to compare this to administer, the administer is from a person to another. But here the using, it is the very same person who did it through himself. Okay, so let's proceed with the unlawful acts. You have their section four. What is section four? Importation of dangerous drug and a controlled precursor and essential chemical. Now take note that the penalty of life imprisonment to death and a fine ranging from 500,000 to 10 million shall be imposed upon any person who unless authorized by law shall import or bring into the Philippines any dangerous drug regardless of the quantity and purity. Even if the same are only for decorative, floral, or culinary purpose, for as long as that is considered to be a dangerous drug, then you are punished under Section 4. So you bring into the Philippines any dangerous drug, controlled precursor, and essential chemical. Now, there is also such person who just financed the importation. So his penalty is a degree lower than the first paragraph who actually imports dangerous drug and a controlled precursor and essential chemical. So you have there the penalty. And then you also have there the penalty for the protector or cuddler. So meaning to say section four can be committed in conspiracy. It can be committed by more than one person. How about section five? Now, if you notice in section five, there are actually many overt acts referred to in section five, but the most common there is sale. Okay, we are very familiar with sale, but it actually includes trading, administration, dispensation, delivery, distribution, and transportation of dangerous drug and or controlled precursor and essential chemical. Penalty, same as section four, life imprisonment to death. But the fine is 500,000 to 10 million. And this penalty shall be imposed upon the person who did the sailing, trading, administration, dispensation, delivery, distribution, and transportation of the dangerous drug. Now, what if what if you are a broker? So, the, the broker is included here. Now here, uh, act as a broker in such transaction, one degree lower. Yeah, 12 years and one to 20 years. So, that 20 years that is 
So, reclusion temporal. This is reclusion temporal. Two degrees lower. Can section 5 be committed by only one person? It can be committed by one person, but it can also be committed by many persons, meaning to say it can be committed in conspiracy. And if the same was done, the acts specified in Section 5 are done within 100 meters from the school, maximum penalty shall be imposed. Maximum penalty shall likewise be imposed if the drug users uses a minor or a mentally incapacitated individuals as runners, couriers, or messenger. If the victim of the offense is a minor, or mentally incapacitated person and died because of the use of dangerous drug and the use of the dangerous drug is the proximate cause of death, maximum penalty shall likewise be imposed. And the maximum penalty for this section shall be imposed upon any person who organizes, manages, or acts as financier of any of the illegal activities prescribed in this section. In other words, this enumeration actually gives you a qualifying circumstances wherein the maximum penalty provided under Section 5 shall be imposed upon the perpetrator. If the perpetrator under Section 5 acts only as a protector or cuddler, then the next paragraph shall govern. So the penalty is 12 years and 1 to 20. In section six, maintenance. So this is another act punish. Maintenance of a den, dive, or resort. Penalty, life imprisonment to death, and fine ranging from 500 to 10 million. Who is the person liable under section six? Upon any person or group of persons who shall maintain a den, dive, or resort where any dangerous drug is used or sold in any form. Now, we describe, we define den, dive, or resort earlier. So the person who is maintaining the place wherein dangerous drug is used or sold. So he shall be prosecuted under Section 6. If what is being maintained there is pre controlled precursor or essential chemical, then the penalty is lower. The first paragraph is higher because what is being maintained there or used is the dangerous drug itself. Now, in section 6, it likewise gives us a qualifying circumstance wherein the maximum penalty as provided for by law shall be imposed. And what are they? If the same is administered, sold, or delivered to a minor, if someone died and the dangerous drug is the proximate cause of the death of the person using the same in such den, dive, or resort, meaning to say someone died in the den, dive, or resort. So that shall be imposed in the maintainer, owner, and or operator of the place where the dangerous drug and or controlled precursor and essential chemical are being sold or used in any form. Now, the next paragraph provides that if such den, dive, or resort is owned by a third person, the same shall be confiscated and instituted in favor of the government. Okay? Owned by a third person, not the accused being arrested. Now, here's the qualification. So that the place shall not be confiscated or instituted. Provided that the criminal complaint shall be specifically alleged that such place is intentionally used in the furtherance of the crime. 
provided further that the prosecution shall prove such intent on the part of the owner to use the property of such purpose, provided finally that the owner shall be included as an accused in the criminal complaint. If the three qualifications qualifications are not proven, meaning to say one of them was not proven by the prosecution, so the legal owner of the place shall have the, the lawful possession being the owner. So the same shall not be confiscated or cheated in favor of the government. Now, if the accused be a financier, then the penalty, the maximum penalty provided under this section shall be imposed. If he is a protector or cuddler, then the same shall be governed by the next paragraph. Now, other than the maintainer, the one who maintains the den, dive, or resort, you have there the employees and visitors. So, in other words, the employees and visitors are governed, both governed under Section 7. Now, we identified earlier if an employee. And if the person who is aware and visited the place knowingly, despite the place being used for pet session, for example, he is considered to be a visitor. So what shall be the penalty to be imposed upon them? 12 years and 1 day to 20, and a fine ranging from 100,000 to 500,000 upon an employee who is aware of the nature of the place. He should be aware of the nature of the place. Now, as far as the visitor is concerned, he shall knowingly visit the place. Okay, He shall knowingly visit, meaning to say it's still intentional. Now, most often than not, in case of raids in a particular place, and then many innocent are actually being included because... They were present at the time of the raid. Of course, they can prove otherwise during trial that he is not aware of the nature of the place. But that would be a matter of defense. Because what the law says is that you can be made criminally liable as an employee or visitor if you are aware of the nature of the place or you knowingly visit the place. Manufacture of dangerous drug and a controlled precursor and essential chemical. So it is governed by Section 8. You have there the penalty of life imprisonment to death and a fine ranging from 500,000 to 10 million pesos. If what is being manufactured is a controlled precursor or essential chemical, then the penalty of 12 years and 1 to 20 and a fine ranging from 100,000 to 500,000 shall be imposed upon the perpetrator. The presence of any controlled precursor, an essential chemical or laboratory equipment in the clandestine laboratory is a prima facie proof of manufacture of any dangerous drug. And it shall be considered an aggravating if the clandestine laboratory is undertaken or established under the following circumstances, you have there the use or, or the presence with or with the help of the minors. It is undertaken within 100 meters of a residential business, church, or school premises. If the clandestine laboratory was secured or protected with booby traps. If the clandestine laboratory was concealed with a legitimate business or operation. So this is especially true if you have there a front business, let's say a restaurant for that matter, and then there is that secret passage going to the clandestine laboratory. Any employment of a practitioner, chemical engineer, public official, or a foreigner, shall likewise aggravate the crime wherein the maximum of the 
prescribed penalty shall be imposed upon the perpetrator. As to the financier, maximum penalty shall likewise be uh, imposed upon him. And then you have there the penalty for the protector or cuddler. So the protector or cuddler could be any person. In section 9, it talks about illegal chemical diversion of controlled precursor and essential chemicals. So um, I have not encountered a person being charged under section 9. So it just uh, punish a person involving in illegal chemical diversion with respect to controlled precursor and essential chemical. In section 10, the overt act punished here is the manufacture or delivery of equipment, instruments, apparatus, and other paraphernalia for dangerous drug under controlled precursor and essential chemical. So what is being manufactured here or delivered are the equipment, instrument, apparatus, and other paraphernalia. So you have there the penalty to be imposed upon the accused. The penalty of imprisonment ranging from six months and one day to four years and a fine ranging from 10,000 to 50 shall be imposed if it will be used to inject, ingest, inhale, or otherwise introduce into the human body a dangerous drug in violation of this act. And then the maximum penalty shall be imposed if he uses a minor or a mentally incapacitated individual to deliver such equipment, instrument, or apparatus, or other paraphernalia for dangerous drugs. Section 11. Aside from Section 5, you have there Section 11, the most common uh, offense. In possession of dangerous drug. You have there the penalty of life imprisonment to death and a fine ranging from 500,000 to 10 million. If it involves these quantities as enumerated, meaning to say your penalty under section 11 varies according to the quantity of dangerous drug being recovered or confiscated from your possession. The maximum uh, the penalty of life imprisonment to death and a fine ranging from 500,000 to 10 million shall be imposed upon any person who, unless authorized by law, shall possess any dangerous drug in the following quantities, regardless of the degree or purity. 10 grams or more of opium. 10 grams or more of morphine. 10 grams or more of heroin, 10 grams of or more of cocaine or cocaine hydrochloride, 50 grams or more of shabu, 10 grams or more of marijuana resin or marijuana resin oil, 500 grams or more of marijuana. So these are referring, if not resin or resin oil, so that's 500 grams. 10 grams or more of other dangerous drugs such as ecstasy, lysergic acid, uh, the TMA, GHB, and those similarly designed or newly introduced drugs under derivatives. Take note under derivatives because uh, they might do some chemical diversion of mixing one from the other, forming another kind of drug so that includes the derivatives without having any therapeutic value or if the quantity possessed is far beyond therapeutic requirements as determined and promulgated by the board. So what if the quantity is less? So it is graduated as follows. Life imprisonment and a fine ranging from 400,000 to 500 if the quantity of shabu is 10 grams or more but less than 50. 
life impri imprisonment of 20 and one day to life imprisonment plus fine if five grams or more, but less than 10 grams of opium, morphine, heroin, cocaine, or cocaine, cocaine hydrochloride, marijuana resin, marijuana resin oil, shabu, other dangerous drugs such as but not limited to ecstasy, PMA, TMA, LSD, GHB, and those similarly designed or newly introduced drugs and their derivatives without having any therapeutic value. And you have there 300 grams or more, but less than 500 grams of marijuana. Usually in our jurisdiction, what is being confiscated is the flowering tops, okay? Flowering tops of the marijuana as well as the leaves. And usually it's dried, the dried one. Uh, still under section 11, imprisonment of 12 years and 1 day to 20 and a fine ranging from 300 to 400,000 if the quantities of dangerous drug are less than 5 grams. What are the drugs referred to? Opium, morphine, heroin, cocaine, or cocaine hydrochloride, marijuana resin, marijuana resin oil, shabu, ecstasy, PMA, TMA, LSD, GHB. How about the marijuana fruiting tops or leaves? Less than 300 grams. That is under paragraph 3. Okay, so that is, this is the lowest, that is, less than less than 5 grams less than 300 grams of marijuana so that's the lowest section 12 what is punished under section 12 while in section 11 it punishes possession of dangerous drug under controlled precursor and essential chemical in section 12 it governs possession of equipment instrument, apparatus, and other paraphernalia for dangerous drug. What is the penalty? Six months and one day to four years and a fine ranging from 10,000 to 50,000. Now, please take notice of this penalty. Six months and one day to four years and a fine ranging from 10,000 to 50,000. To whom shall be imposed upon any person who possess or have under his or her control any equipment, instrument, apparatus, and other paraphernalia fit or intended for smoking, consuming, administering, injecting, ingesting, and introducing any dangerous drug into the body. Provided that in case of medical practitioner and various professionals who are required to carry such equipment, instrument, apparatus, and other paraphernalia in the practice of their profession, the board shall prescribe the necessary implementing guidelines hereof. So you have their section 11 and then section 12. Take note that you have there the prima facie evidence that your possession of such equipment, instrument, apparatus, or other paraphernalia fit or intended for any of the purposes mentioned, the possessor, that is an evidence that the possessor has smoked, consumed, administered to himself or herself, injected, ingested, or used a dangerous drug, and shall be presumed to have violated Section 15 as well. Section 13, it talks about possession of dangerous drug, similar to Section 11. But the difference is that Section 13 governs if your possession was during parties, social gathering, or meetings. That's why the penalty provided under Section 11 shall likewise be the penalty to be imposed upon the perpetrator under Section 13. Take note that any person found possessing any dangerous drug during a party or at, or a so, are at a social gathering or meeting in approximate company of at least two persons 
Meaning to say, you, the perpetrator, plus two, that is considered to be in a party, social gathering, or meeting already, govern under section, section 13. Okay, that is possession of dangerous drug during party, social gathering, or meeting. Section 14 is similar to section 12. Possession of equipment, instrument, apparatus, or other paraphernalia. But the distinction lies with the how the same was committed. Like in section 13, section 14 governs if the perpetrator was in possession of the paraphernalia during a party, social gathering, or meeting. And it carries with it the penalty as provided under section 12. So again, section 13 imposes as well the penalty as provided under section 11 because the two are similar, possession of dangerous drug. Only that in section 13, it shall govern if the same was done during a party, social gathering, or meeting. Now, section 14, this is similar to section 12, possession of paraphernalia. Only that section 14 governs if the same, if the possession was done during a party, social gathering, or meeting. But it follows the penalty provided under section 12. So after section 14, you have there section 15, use of dangerous drug. Now take note, being positive in the screening test would not be sufficient. A person can only be made to be prosecuted under section 15 and can be made criminally liable after a confirmatory test shall be imposed. Penalty, six months rehabilitation uh, for the first time offender. Second offender, six years and one day to 12 years of imprisonment and a fine ranging from 50,000 to 2 million, provided that this section shall not be applicable where the person tested is also found to have his or her possession, the quantity of any dangerous drug provided under Section 11 of this Act, in which case the provision stated therein shall apply. Okay, so it could be possible that Section 15 will be absorbed in Section 11 if you have there the, the quantity of such dangerous drug confiscated at the time of the alleged commission by the accused. Section 16 talks about cultivation or culture of plants. So in our jurisprudence, our jurisdiction, we may be talking about a, a marijuana, cultivation of marijuana. Who is liable? Any person who shall plant. The one who cultivate or the one who culture. Except. If the planting, cultivation, or the culture is for medical research purposes. So you cannot be made liable under Section 16. Now, if, you, if the planting there is not for medical research, other than the one who planted, cultivated, or cultured the plant, the owner of the land or portions thereof, or the greenhouses in which such plants were cultivated or cultured, they are liable for as long as they did it with their knowledge. The financier, the protector and cuddler of these uh, greenhouses or lands wherein these plants were being planted, cultivated or cultured shall likewise be liable under section 16. Maintenance and keeping of original records or transactions on dangerous drugs. So we are dealing with a practitioner, the manufacturer, the wholesaler, importer, distributor, dealer, or retailer. They are actually required to keep the original records of the transaction. 
on any dangerous drug and uncontrolled precursor and essential chemical. They have to keep because they have their the reportorial requirements. Same with the pharmacist. So they are actually required to submit a report on who are these patients that are being dispensed with Nubain, for example. And of course, remember that that is a regulated drug. So you have there the prescription prior to dispensation of this regulated drug. Section 18. Unnecessary prescription of dangerous drug. When shall there be unnecessary prescription of dangerous drug? You have there the penalty of 12 years and one day to 20 years and a fine ranging from 100,000 to 500,000 and the additional penalty of the revocation of his or her license to practice. Who shall be liable? It shall be imposed upon the practitioner. Who shall prescribe any dangerous drug to any person whose physical or physiological condition does not require the use or in the dosage prescribed therein as determined by the board. In other words, you prescribe a drug to a person whose body does not need it or you prescribe to a patient that needs it but beyond the dosage as prescribed or as needed by the patient. So that is covered under unnecessary prescription of dangerous drug. In unlawful prescription, life imprisonment to death is the penalty and fine of 500 to 10 million. To whom shall this be imposed? This shall be imposed upon any, okay, any person who unless authorized by law shall make or issue a prescription or any other writing purporting to be a prescription of any dangerous drug. So there is really falsification as far as section 19 is concerned because it is done by any person who make a prescription, a purported prescription of any dangerous drug. So as a rule, if you have their property being used in the commission of any of the violation under the law, as a rule, it shall be confiscated and forfeited in favor of the state unless they are property of a third person not liable for the unlawful act, but those which are not of lawful commerce shall be ordered destroyed without delay. So that is section 20. Now here comes Republic Act number 10640. 10640, I put here in the middle because the trust of 10640 is amending section 21 of RA 9165. Okay, it amends section 21 of RA 9165. And what is the amendment all about? Custody and disposition of confiscated seas and or surrender dangerous drug, plant sources of dangerous drug, controlled precursor and essential chemical, instruments, paraphernalia, and or laboratory equipment. It says here, the PDEA shall take charge and have custody of all dangerous drugs, plant sources of dangerous drugs, controlled precursor and essential chemical, as well as instruments, paraphernalia, and or laboratory equipment so confiscated, seized, and or surrendered for proper disposition. Now, if you notice, it mentioned about PDEA. In other words, RA9165, the main implementer is PDEA, but it shall not divest the PNP from enforcing the provisions of the law. And most often than not, it is the PNP who is actually uh, 
or let's say more visible in the implementation of RA9165. So example, uh, I, I think you have heard that a person is being arrested after a by bus operation has been conducted upon him. Now, usually, these are governed by the PNP. There are procedures that has to be followed. There are procedures that has to be um, imposed so that the items being confiscated during the by bus operation shall be preserved. Its integrity and evidentiary value shall be preserved for purposes of a successful prosecution of the accused. Okay. Imagine yourself on a scenario that a person is being arrested after a successful by bus operation was conducted against him. Now, after the consummation of the sale, now later you will learn what are the elements of the crime. We will talk later of elements of the crime. So, I am showing to you the procedure. Imagine on a scenario that there is that by bus operation conducted by the person. The... By bus operation was successful, meaning to say there was a successful exchange of the by bus money and the dangerous drug. By bus money in possession of the pusher buyer or the police decoy pretending to be a, a buyer of dangerous drug, he gave it to the drug pusher. In return, the drug pusher handing the the drugs to the police decoy or the, the pusher buyer. So there were there was exchange, meaning to say the crime for violation under Section 5 was consummated with the successful exchange of the buy bus money and the object, which is the uh, shabu. So af thereafter, that would give the police officer may maybe the, the pusher buyer himself or the backup team of the pusher buyer to cause the arrest of the accused after cutting him in the act of committing a crime. Meaning to say, in flagrante, committing a violation under Section 5. So, they cause his arrest. Now, for purposes of convicting this particular person, procedure has to be done. Here comes section 25. Now, it says here that Pideya shall take charge of the custody, meaning to say, take note that the apprehending team is the PNP, meaning to say the, the PNP has to turn over the same to the Pideya because they take charge for the proper disposition. But Per, per rule, it shall be done under the following procedure. So let's continue with section 21. So the apprehending team, the PNP in our example, having initial custody and control of the dangerous drug, if it is dangerous drug, controlled precursor and essential chemical, if the same is a controlled precursor or essential chemical or the instrument or paraphernalia and or laboratory equipment, if there is any, immediately after the seizure and confiscation, conduct a physical inventory of the seized item and photograph. What do we mean by physical inventory? Meaning to say, they will make a list inventory for that matter making a list on what has been confiscated at the time of the alleged commission of the crime by the accused. And aside from making that document entitled inventory or uh, inventory of confiscated articles, whatever it is, you have the document listing 
marking the 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 confiscated item and then you also have there the photographing meaning to say pictures has to be done now take note that this has to be done in the presence of all accused or the persons from whom such items were confiscated and or seized or his or her representative or counsel now why is it there is this representative or counsel now this is specifically true if the operation is not through a bypass operation but through the implementation of a search warrant so other than the bypass operation it could be possible that there is that search warrant being issued against the accused and the searching team went there in order to implement okay in order to implement either at the time of the uh, of the search the defendant was there or the accused was there or in his absence you have their representative or maybe his counsel as the case may be who is required to be a witness on the act of preparing the inventory as well as the photographing you have their elected public official when we say elected public official si barangay kapitan barangay konsihal barangay councilor usually barangay tanod is not an elected public official so that is very clear elected public official that is one witness who is witness to you have their and meaning to say two is required representative of the national prosecution service or from the prosecutor's office or the media under the old law all the three must be present but with the amendment only two are required one is the elected public official and the second one is either representative from the nps or from the media in their function as a witness what shall they do they are required to sign the copies of the inventory and be given a copy thereof that's what they do now take note that if you are a wide reader there are many jurisprudence that would say um, it is fatal to the prosecution because the witnesses only arrive at the time of inventory taking. At the time of the alleged bypass operation, they are not around. There are many of them. The present holding jurisprudence at present is that it is not required that these witnesses be present at the time of the bypass operation for as long as they are present to witness the inventory taking and the photographing it is sufficient okay provided that the physical inventory and photograph shall be conducted at the place where the search warrant is served if it is with a search warrant or at the place where the or at the nearest police station or at the nearest office of the apprehending team whichever is practicable in case of warrantless seizures so warrantless seizures so we are talking about the bypass operation or the entrapment operation that is the same bypass entrapment the same search warrant in the place now take note it says here, or at the nearest police station or at the nearest office of the apprehending team, whichever is practicable in case of warrantless seizure. Now, sometimes it would be possible that after the, the alleged bypass, there would be a commotion, there would be merging of people or the, the neighbors in the usually this is done in a slump area or 
uh, in a place where many are actually converging. So, yes, can we call it a squatters area? So, it could be possible that these people now are actually there with the marites all around. It's actually fine, but the problem is, what if these neighbors would practically help the accused in such a way that they are now throwing stones to the apprehending team or the, the, the police for that matter? Thereby, there would be that security issue. They will put into compromise the subject um, operation. So they are actually allowed to pull out from the area. That's why you have their nearest police office or their police station or nearest office of the apprehending team. Sometimes they, they do it in the barangay hall because uh, of security issues. So that is section 21. Now, take note that section 21, this physical inventory of the seized item and the photographing, it's, it's, it is actually mandatory. It is required to be done. No question. If the apprehending team fail to comply strictly section 21 as to the conduct of inventory, photographing, and the required witnesses um, affixing their signature on the inventory, will it be fatal to the prosecution of the perpetrator? You have there the proviso. Provided finally that non-compliance of these requirements under justifiable grounds, as long as the integrity and the evidentiary value of the seized items are property, properly preserved by the apprehending officer or apprehending team, shall not render void an invalid such seizures and custody over said items. In other words, while Section 21 is mandatory, it shall not be fatal to the prosecution of the accused, meaning to say we can still secure the conviction of the accused for as long as the integrity and the evidentiary value of the seized items are properly preserved by the apprehending team. That is what you called as the principle of chain of custody or the chain of custody principle. Okay, process from the time it was confiscated until such time that the same was presented in court as evidence. You have their under justifiable grounds. It shall not be fatal to the prosecution of the accused. We can still secure his conviction. Now, in a decided case, now let us say that only the elected official was able to attach his signature, affix his signature in the inventory. No representative from the NPS, no representative of the media. What shall the apprehending team do? They have to, in their affidavit, they have to state already what are the grounds justifying the non-compliance of the requirement. They have to state therein that because of the time, it was already 11 uh, in, in the evening and many calls were actually done. It remains um, uh, unanswered or let us say that the, the rain, there was a sudden rain that took place and the place suddenly and the neighbors were converging. So things like that. You have to justify the reason why you failed to comply the requirements as mentioned under Section 21. So meaning to say, it shall not be fatal for as long as you can prove that despite the fact that there is that missing witness, the evidentiary value, this um, shabu, that is being presented in court as evidence as against the accused is the very same shabu that was confiscated from his possession, then that is fine. Now, what shall be done? 
Now, take note that after the inventory taking, let us say that all the documents had been prepared, what would be the next move? After the processing, the usually it is the pusher buyer shall also prepare a request to subject to to so, so, to subject the subjected shabu, the one being confiscated from the possession of the accused, to the crime lab for purposes of qualitative examination. I forgot. In the inventory taking, the pusher buyer will, will actually, aside from the making of a list, he also has to mark each piece of evidence. So if there are more than one sachet of shabu, then he will mark each of them. If he also confiscate from the possession of the accused, let's say, other evidences such as tutor or any other evidence that was confiscated at the time of the now, take note that he, he was arrested for violation under Section 5. After Section 5, wherein he was already lawfully arrested as a matter of procedure, the police officers shall do further search upon his person, including his immediate vicinity. If there are other drugs confiscated or recovered, Aside from the one being the subject of the sale or the, the buy bus, that other drugs confiscated from his possession shall be subject under Section 11. Katong drugs subject of the sale or the buy bus shall be the, the evidence under Section 5. All the rest of the drugs, Section 11, either you found it or confiscated it on top of the table from his left pocket, his right pocket, from another bag near his possession, they all shall be under Section 11, not Section 5. The Shabu, which is the subject of the sale, would be the only evidence against the accused for violation under Section 5. Now, how about you have there the tutor, syringe, uh, fuel, for that matter, also confiscated. That would be subject under Section 12. Okay, Section 12, separate offense. If you also found um, another contraband, for example, you have there a firearm, unregistered firearm, you can actually confiscate that and charge another offense against the accused for illegal possession of firearm. Those are separate offenses. Okay, separate offenses that does not violate the right of the accused against due process because the elements are different. Now, going back to the Shabu, I've told you that the pusher buyer as well will likewise prepare that document request for laboratory examination. Together with the Shabu, nag mention Mantano, Section 5, Section 11, together with the different objects for Section 5, Section 11, he has to, he had marked them individually and putting in the inventory their their respective marking as mark in the evidence itself they shall likewise be placed in a sealed that uh, usually a sealed transparent plastic then put another marking if the pusher buyer was also able to recover the buy bus money much better he will likewise make a proper marking on it okay so here comes the pusher buyer ready to deliver the subject shabu to the crime lab to have it uh, subjected for laboratory examination so in the crime lab they also have their procedure there in fact based on experience as what uh as for the years that I have been prosecuting drug cases, in the crime lab itself, they have their the so-called chain of custody. From the um the one who received the drugs in the crime lab, he will receive it. Nanay tatak, they will mark it, uh, receive it. Thereafter, he will uh forward it 
to the chemist himself. Of course, the chemist will do the uh, laboratory examination. Now, thereafter, the laboratory, uh, after the conduct of the examination, the chemist will likewise prepare a, a chemistry report. Let's say positive of Shabu. So he will put there. In fact, the chemist himself will likewise put his own marking on the evidences that he subjected to to laboratory examination. Now, aside from the conduct of la laboratory examination, he will likewise prepare a document, the chemistry report. Now, when he is done, when everything is done, he will likewise endorse it to their evidence custodian. So, they have there that chain of custody document torn in evidence to the custodian. The custodian will receive it at this date, this time. Now, for purposes of prosecution, the court shall issue a subpoena ducestecum a testificandum to the chemist for him to turn over the court the subject shabu as well as the original of the chemistry report because usually what is being issued to the pusher buyer or to the police is just a, a photocopy and that would be attached to the complaint to where they will submit it to the prosecutor's office for purposes of filing among other the documents they have prepared. So, from the prosecutor's office, of course, they will prepare the info filed in court. So, once in court, let's say the accused had been arraigned already, the court will issue a subpoena to the chemist. So, what shall the chemist do upon receipt of the subpoena? Subpoena docestecum ad testificandum. When we say ad testificandum, that is the mere testimony alone. But you have there subpoena docestecum. The tecum there is that you are required to bring along with you documents or evidences as follows as listed in the subpoena. So when the, the, the chemist receive it, remember he turned over the evidence to the evidence custodian. Okay. So what shall he do? He will pull out or withdraw the evidences from the evidence custodian. So from the torn in receipt, they have there the withdrawal receipt. So the chemist now getting back or withdrawing the evidences from the evidence custodian. They have there that document. So the chemist now is in possession of the dangerous drug as well as the original of the chemistry report, among others. Now what shall he do? He will turn over the same to the court. And in turn, the court will issue an acknowledgement receipt that they receive it from chemists so and so the following. They had the list. Now, when the pusher buyer is actually called to the witness stand to testify, how will he do it? Okay, he will be asked, you, you said you received the Subject Shabu from accused Juan de la Cruz. If you will be shown that Shabu, will you be able to identify it? He will answer, yes, your honor. What is your basis in saying, yes, that you can identify it? Because I put a marking on it, he will state the marking. Okay, that's how you do it. Okay, here comes the prosecutor because he... He will be using the, the evidences that were turned over by the chemist to the court. Now, I am showing to you this uh, sachet of shabu. And there is a marking. Will you please state for the record the marking encrypted on the evidence? Then he will state it. Presumably, the same uh, marking that he put on the very sh same shabu that he confiscated or he received from the accused during the bybus operation. Okay, so you have there the marking, you have there the date and the signature of the pusher buyer. So meaning to say, we were able to 
preserve the integrity and evidentiary value of the subject shabu. We are able to show to the court that the shabu, that the pusher buyer is testifying and identifying before the court now presented as evidence is the very same shabu that was confiscated from the possession of the accused or given by the accused during the by bus operation. Okay, so that's how you do it. Now, in, in paragraph 3 of section 21, this is applicable if you have there a bulk of shabu that was confiscated from the accused. So, a certification of the forensic laboratory examination results. So, this is the chemistry report I am talking about earlier. So, you have there the examination results which shall be done by the forensic laboratory examiner to be issued immediately upon receipt of the subject item. Provided that when the volume of the dangerous drug, plant sources of dangerous drug under controlled precursor and essential chemical does not allow the completion of testing within the time frame, a partial laboratory examination shall be provisionally issued, stating therein the quantities of dangerous drug still to be examined by the forensic laboratory. Provided, however, that a final certification shall be used, uh, issued immediately upon completion of the said examination and certification. So again, this, of course, if you have there the bulk of dangerous drug that was uh, recovered from the possession of the accused. Much more when the, during the previous admin, so if you, if you notice, there was there a bulk of arrests because of their massive campaign against illegal drugs and the, the forensic laboratory examiner, we only have three, I think three, in, in, in the whole of Visayas, they were overwhelmed by the number of drugs that shall be subjected to laboratory examination. It actually caused the delay that um, we were not able to observe strictly Article 125. Remember that we have to file the information within this prescriptive period. You have the 12, 18, 36 hours. But with, we cannot file the, the cases in court absent the chemical, uh, the chemistry report. So we have to wait. Okay, so during that time, we're, we're just lenient as far as the observance of the prescriptive period. Now, would it be possible that a drug may yield negative of the presence of dangerous drug? The answer is yes. I've also inquest a person that during the examination, uh, no, no, during the inquest proceeding, of course, he was charged. I do the inquest, but when I, I saw the chemistry report, it was negative. Okay, it was negative, meaning to say the shabu that was confiscated from his possession is not actually shabu, but just tawas. Okay, but just tawas. So it's negative. Of course, I have to dismiss the complaint. Okay, that ends section 21. I have mentioned uh, the chain of custody principle. Meaning to say, in the chain of custody principle, you have to present evidence up to the to each link from the time the, the shabu was confiscated, it was turned over to the chemist and to the chemist back to the court. And now here comes the uh, pusher buyer identifying it. And then the same was offered in evidence that is chain of custody. You have to present evidence to prove to each of the link to which this drug has been uh, passed on until the same was presented in court as evidence. Okay, so that is the chain of custody principle. Section 23, section 24, of course, that has been declared unconstitutional. So there is that 
thing as plea bargaining now. And then you have their probation. So for purposes of the plea bargaining, so I'm going to show you administrative matter number 18, the 16 SC. So that is the plea bargaining framework. Now, if you notice here, what can be plea bargain are those under section 11, section 5, 13, Hi, 14. No, no 14. No, no 14. Section 7. Okay. Now, when shall there be plea bargaining under Section 11? Only if it involves shabu and marijuana. For shabu, it shall be less than 5 grams. The, the shabu that was confiscated from the possession of the accused. And if it be marijuana, less than 300 grams. No other drugs shall be subject for plea bargaining, but only shabu and marijuana with this quantity involved. Now, how about section 5? Again, shabu and marijuana only. When the quantity is less than 1 gram for shabu, less than 10 grams for marijuana only. Under section 13, so we have to refer to section 11, same thing, marijuana and shabu, less than 5 grams for shabu, less than 300 grams for marijuana. Same here. Okay, same here. Only that was the difference for ele section 11 and section 13. In section 13, the same was, the possession was during a party, social gathering, or meeting. Employee or visitor, they are allowed to plea bargain if there is no person being charged for maintaining the said drug, then dive or resort under section six. Now, plea bargaining is also allowed when an accused is charged with possession of shabu weighing five grams to 9.99 and marijuana weighing 300 to 499. However, probation of the accused will not be allowed in such instances. Probation not allowed under this paragraph. Okay, under this paragraph. In other words, would probation be available under this paragraph? The answer is yes. Now, if you plea bargain under this, the penalty to be imposed is the one I've shown you earlier, Katusa Section 12, six months and one day to four years as maximum. And fine of 10,000 to 50,000, that is the usual penalty to be imposed. And since the same does not exceed the maximum of the indeterminate penalty did not exceed six years, hence the accused may apply for probation. Here, Dere. Because it is more than 5 grams, more than 300 grams, the penalty is higher, more than six, uh, 6 years, probation will not be allowed. So no plea bargaining under these quantities of shabu and marijuana, uh, 10 grams or more, no plea bargaining. That's why it's 9.99. 5 grams or more of marijuana, sale of shabu exclusively with a quantity of 10 grams, uh, 10 grams, 1 gram or more. Pero that more must not be more than 9.99. Sale of marijuana exclusively with a quantity of 10 grams or more and then sale of of all kinds of dangerous drug, no plea bargaining. Okay, no plea bargaining. Qualifying circumstances. 
in the commission of the crime that is under the influence of dangerous drug. So that is a qualifying aggravating circumstance. So what is the effect? Qualifying, it qualifies the crime. So take note of Article 14 of the RPC. Attempt or conspiracy. Now earlier, some of the provisions I've already mentioned, this can be committed in conspiracy. If it is committed by more than one person. Now, it can on also be committed in attempt. Importation, uh, it's more on conspiracy but not attempt. In sale, there might, might be attempted sale. Okay, most common, di ba? By bus operation, entrapment. Now, when shall there be attempted sale? Meaning to say, the sale has not been consummated. It could be possible that after the handing of the, the mark money, the, the accused was not able to deliver or to hand in the shabu to the pusher buyer because he sensed that he was being entrapped, so he ran away. So there was no consummation of the sale. There was no um, successful exchange between the mark money and the subject shabu. So it's only attempt, attempted sale. Maintenance of a then type of resort, more on conspiracy. In manufacture, more of conspiracy. Same with cultivation or culture, more on conspiracy. Now, in section 27, there is such thing as misappropriation, misapplication, or failure to account for the confiscated, seized, or surrendered dangerous drug by the public officer or employee in charge with the custody of this confiscated items that is governed under section 27 for if the offender be a local elected official or a national official he shall be removed from office and perpetually disqualified so aside from the those mentioned maximum penalty shall be imposed and in addition, there are two absolute perpetual disqualification. Planting of evidence, that is penalty of death, section 29. If the offender is a partnership, corporation, or association, or other juridical entity, who shall be liable? Partnership, corporation, or association, or juridical entity, it shall be the partner, President, director, manager, trustee, estate administrator, or other officer who consents to or knowingly tolerates such violation. If the offender is a foreigner, so after the service of sentence, he shall be immediately re deported, except if the penalty is death. Um, any person who willingly testifies against such person described above, shall be immune from prosecution and punishment. Uh, it shall include the state witness. So, a co-accused who turned to be a state witness. Accessory penalty. You have there um, deprivation of parental authority. So, you have their civil interdiction. Okay, civil interdiction. When shall there be mandatory drug testing? Applicants for dr dr driver's license as provided under RA10586. And then you have their applicants for a firearms license and for permit to carry firearms outside residence. As to secondary and tertiary schools, it shall be on random. Employees and offices of public and private offices in random. But it shall be to everyone, officers and members of the military, police, and other law enforcement agencies. 
F and J, I put their X, X, X that has been declared already as unconstitutional by the Supreme Court in these joint petitions. So F and J, uh, exclude them, declared unconstitutional. Issue ones of false or fraudulent drug test result, you have there the penalty covered under Section 37. And then include, um, aside from the, the penalty, you also have there the revocation of license and practice of profession. So in dispensation, pharmacists dealing in dangerous drugs under controlled precursor and essential chemical shall keep an original record of sales, purchases, acquisitions, and deliveries of dangerous drug. So they have their reportorial requirement. Article 4 talks about participation of the family, students, teachers, school authorities in the enforcement of this act. So that's why you have there a school-free uh, drug-free school. And then you have there a drug-free workplace. And then you also have there the participation by the LGUs. That's why they also have their surprise drug testing on their employees. Now, Article 8 talks about voluntary submission of a drug dependent to confinement, treatment, and rehabilitation. So these are the people who are using drugs that wishes to be rehabilitated. So what shall be the procedure? He shall undergo an examination by a DOH accredited physician. And that physician shall issue a certification that indeed the applicant is a drug dependent. So the board shall now designate a center to which this drug dependent shall undergo uh, treatment and rehabilitation of not less than six months. Unless he can afford that the DOH accredited physician where there is no center near or accessible to the residents and the dependent is below 18 and a first-time offender and his non-confinement will not pose any serious danger, then he shall have that in his house. Okay? He can have that in his house, but not in the center. Now, confinement in a center for treatment and rehabilitation shall not exceed one year. Meaning to say, from the original six months, pwede siya ma... Um, so, anyway... Ma extend. Okay, after which time the court as well as the board shall appraise by the head of the treatment and rehabilitation center of the status of the said drug dependent and determine whether further confinement will be for the welfare of the drug dependent and his or her family or community. Now, if the drug dependent has successfully been prosecuted, uh, rehabilitated, then he will be exempted from criminal liability under the voluntary submission program. And he shall be finally discharged from confinement and exempt from criminal liability under Section 15. Okay, so he is now released from the center. So what shall be done? He has to undergo at least 18 months of... Of the aftercare. Okay, this is aftercare. Following temporary discharge from confinement in the center or in the case of a dependent place in the care of a DOH accredited physician, uh, the aftercare program and follow up schedule formulated by the DSWD and approved by the, the board. So after his discharge, he shall undergo an 18 month aftercare program. Provided that the capability building of the local government social worker shall be undertaken by the DSWD. So again, you have there the 18-month aftercare. 
Now, however, should the DOH found that during the initial aftercare and follow-up program of 18 months, the drug-dependent further requires further treatment, meaning to say nag-relapse and uses again drugs. So he will be recommitted to the center for confinement. Then thereafter, he shall be temporary release and ordered release for another aftercare and follow-up program under this section. So same procedure to follow. Now, what if after those two rounds, the drug dependent is not rehabilitated? That is the time that he will be charged for violation under Section 15 and prosecuted like any other offender. If convicted, he shall be credited for the period of confinement and rehabilitation in the center in the service of his or her sentence. Mora ragihapon o na credit. It shall be credited and he is deemed to have been fully served. His penalty is deemed to have fully served with the time that he was in and out of the center uh, fully served, deemed fully served. Now for instances where during your confinement you escape uh, the dependent once again escape, he shall be charged for violation of section 16 and subjected under section 21 either upon order of the court or upon order of order of the board or upon order of the court as the case may be take note that a uh, during the voluntary submission program the records will be confidential and you also have their compulsory confinement of a drug dependent who refuses to apply under the voluntary submission program so usually these are done through the relatives and then compulsory submission of drug dependent charged with offenses to treat with an offense to treatment and rehabilitation. Now, section 62 is a provision wherein the accused was not charged for section 15 but was charged for an offense. And usually they committed the offense because of the use of dangerous drug. Now, some of the relatives would opt to have the criminal prosecution suspended and put the, the accused in a, a rehab. So that is governed under Section 62. Prescription of the offense charge against drug dependent under compulsory submission program uh, during that time that is suspended. Now, what if, if the perpetrator is a minor, meaning to say, Below 18, over 15, acting with discernment. Um, so if he is found to be liable, he can avail of suspended sentence. Okay, suspension of sentence of a first-time minor offender. He can avail of suspended sentence for as long as at the time of the promulgation of judgment, he is not yet 22 years old. That's why I put there, reconcile with RA 9344. So we'll discuss more on this when we had RA 9344. But all you need to remember here is that uh, a first-time minor offender may avail of suspended sentence if he is found to be guilty for an offense so after when the, the minor avail of suspended sentence he would actually be put in a center so in Cebu we have their RRCY uh, regional rehabilitation CY center for youth okay regional rehabilitation center for youth so those are the place that was the place wherein the, the minor shall be put after availing of suspended sentence. What was the purpose there? Rehabilitation to prepare him from reintegration into the family and to the community. So the, the center will recommend for his release. So he will be released subject to the supervision of a, let's say, responsible family. Then if 
during the superv su supervision period, he proves to be rehabilitated, then a final discharge shall be issued in his favor. So it says here, 15 years old, over 15 years old at the time of the commission, but not more than 18. At that time when judgment should have been promulgated. So we have to reconcile this with RA 9344. So even if at the time of the judgment you are over 18, for as long as you are a minor at the time of the commission, you are considered to be a CICL. And you can avail of suspended sentence for as long as you are not yet 22 at the time of the promulgation of the judgment. So here, promulgation. So what if you avail of suspended sentence and thereafter you violated the conditions of your suspended sentence, you will be brought back to court for the promulgation of your sentence. So the judgment now, the decision now shall be read to you. And then where will you serve your sentence? Will you be put inside the BJMP? No. Uh, in agricultural comes. So that is what the law provides. But another option is you have their probation or community service for the first-time minor offender in lieu of imprisonment. So you have learned in probation that it shall be um, filed within the period of perfecting an appeal. And you have there the penalty not exceeding six years, for example. Now, all those requirements... All those qualifications shall not be observed if the if it involves a CICL. Okay, so take this as an exception to those provided under the law on probation. It can be filed even beyond the 15 day period. Um, just read 72 and 73. Who has jurisdiction? RTC designated as a dangerous drugs court or a drugs court. Um, and in the NPS, the National Prosecution Service, the PI preliminary investigation shall be terminated 30 days from the date of filing. So unlike or other ordinary cases or other cases, it shall be 60. But if it is drugs under 9165, 30 days. And take note that the information shall be filed within 24 hours after the termination of the investigation. As to trial, the, prosecute, the, the proceeding in court, it shall be finished not later than 60 days from the date of filing, and it shall be decided 15 days from the date of submission for the case for resolution. Possible questions on RA 9165. How to prosecute successfully an accused under Section 5 of RA 9165? Or it can be stated what are the elements of Section 5? If we talk about elements, you have their identities of the buyer, seller, object, and the consideration. And then the delivery of the thing sold and the payment. People versus Partosa. Who is the buyer here? The pusher buyer, seller, the drug pusher. The object is the shabu. Consideration is the money. We're talking earlier about the buy bus money or mark money. Mark or the buy bus mark in itself because if you have there let's say a 200 piece of bill uh, there would be initial of the pusher buyer whatever marking it is that's why it's called as mark money so that those are the elements okay elements you also have the delivery of the thing sold and the payment 
But if you notice, the question here is how to prosecute successfully. So aside from the elements under Section 5, you have to include corpus delicti. The corpus delicti there is the suspected substance the police officer sees from the accused. It is the same thing presented in court during trial. So how do you prove all the elements of the crime? Of course, you have to testify, present evidence, and how about the corpus delicti? Through the chain of custody, you have their section 21. So that is how to prosecute successfully an accused under section 5. How about section 11 for possession of dangerous drug? Elements, accused was in possession of the dangerous drug. He is not authorized by law. And the possession was freely and consciously done by the accused. One, two, three elements of the crime. But if you are asked how to prosecute successfully, again, you have to include the corpus delicti. Meaning to say, you have to prove that the evidence there that was presented before the court as an evidence is the very same shabu that was confiscated from the possession of the accused. That's why you have there the chain of custody principle. How to prove the corpus delicti or explain the chain of custody principle? So the chain of custody establishes the identity of the subject substance. It requires the testimony be presented about every link in the chain from the moment the item is seized up to the time it is offered in evidence. Now, take note that in the examples, in the scenario I've given you earlier on the by bus operation, I've told you there was their shabu, which is the subject of the by bus operation. And when a further search was made in his person pursuant to a lawful warrantless arrest that was done to him, more shabu were confiscated. Now take note that this shabu subject of the section 5 and the shabu that shall be subject under section 11 should not be mixed up. Because if that would be mixed up, then that would create doubt as to the corpus delicti. That will result to the acquittal of the accused. That's why the marking there is very important and they have to be put separately on a sealed transparent plastic or kanabi itong mga sanang atong ano ay mga what kind of plastic we have the sealed plastics. So that's how you do it. Is compliance of Section 21 mandatory? The answer is yes, it is mandatory, but it admits an exception. Non-compliance with the provisions is not fatal. In fact, it is settled that non-compliance of Section 21 of the IRR does not render the accused arrest illegal or make the items inadmissible. What is imperative is the preservation of the integrity and the evidentiary value of the seized item as the same would be utilized in the determination of the guilt or innocence of the accused. What is by bus operation? Or is, is entrapment legal? By bus operation is an entrapment technique employed by a peace officer as an effective way of apprehending a chemical in the act of a criminal in the act of the commission of the offense. I also include their case build up. Now, this is usually done uh, in the process of surveillance. Case series of activities in anti-drug operations such as but not limited to casing validation, surveillance, verification up to the time of completion of necessary information as basis for possible operations. So that is case build up. How about instigation? Is instigation legal? Instigation is the means by which the accused is lured into the commission of the offense charge in order to prosecute him. So we'll now have to distinguish entrapment from instigation. So as to method, 
in entrapment, a method by which the law enforces employed means, method, and forms to apprehend a criminal who is about to commit or in the process of committing a crime. While in instigation, the police officer induce a person to commit a crime. As to the intention, of course, in entrapment, the person is already in the it's already in the mind of the person to commit a crime he is predisposed to commit the crime whereas in instigation the person induced does not have the intention to commit the crime the accused is not predisposed he is merely enticed or lured or talked into committing the crime as to malice um, nobody induces or prods the accused into the commission. The original design to commit crime comes from the accused himself. That is entrapment. On the other hand, in instigation, it comes from the public officer who induces the accused to commit the crime. Seed of malice was planted by the public officer. The criminal intent originates in the mind of the instigator and the accused is lured into the commission of the offense. Idea to commit the crime, the criminal has already decided to commit the crime and the police officer merely introduced means or devices in order to apprehend the criminal that is in entrapment but in instigation it came from the police officer. Criminal liability in entrapment Entrapped person is criminally liable. In instigation, both the inducer and instigator are to be charged. But the latter is not criminally liable. Meaning to say the person instigated, not criminally liable. That is an absolutory cause. So I hope you can still recall what an absolutory cause is. So review. Cream 1, specifically under, I think, in exempting. So, instigation there is one of the absolutory causes. As to whether being an absolutory cause, entrapment, not an absolutory cause. The offense was committed by him, free from in influence or the instigation of the detective. While in instigation, it's an absolutory cause. It absorbs the accused of any guilt. Entrapment, not a bar to prosecution and conviction. In instigation, accused must be acquitted. As to legality of the method, entrapment is a legitimate procedure prescribed by the rules, while instigation is not legal. So other way around, as as in the two, bar two thousand and three, and then you have there the suggested answer. So let's have some illustration of these scenarios. Entrapment illustration: A, an anti-narcotic agent of the government acted as a pusher buyer of shabu, and negotiated with B, a suspected drug pusher who is unaware that A is a police officer. A then issued mark money to B, who handed a sachet of shabu to B. Thereupon, A signaled his anti-narcotic team to close in and arrest B. This is a case of entrapment because the criminal mind is in B already when A transacted with him. Now, how about instigation? Because the members of an anti-narcotic team are already known to drug pushers, A, the team leader approached and persuaded B to act as a pusher buyer and transact with C, the suspected drug pusher. For the purpose, A gave B mark money be used in buying shabu from C. After C handed the sachet of shabu to B, the latter handed the mark money to C. The team closed in and placed B and C under arrest. Under the facts, B is not criminally liable for his participation in the transaction because he was acting only under instigation by the law enforcer. So he was instigated. Now, multiple, multiple offenses. I partly um, illustrated this one. 
when I discuss section 21. A, acted as pusher, buyer, transaction with B, a drug peddler. A, handed to him the mark money of 200 peso bill, and the latter in turn handed to him as a shake containing white crystalline substance containing shabu. A, with the help of the rest of the team, succeeded in arresting B. Thereafter, A made a further search upon the person of B, to which A found five more sachets of shabu in his pocket. Also recovered on top of the table are another five sachets of shabu, a weighing scale, aluminum fuel, and strips, and beside is a forty-five caliber of firearm, which B failed to present any authority to possess. What crimes are committed, if any? Why? Is he qualified to avail of probation? Why? As to the first question, what are... What crimes are committed? So you have there section 5. With respect to the sachet of shabu that was subject of the sale. Section 11. With respect to the 5 plus 5, 10 sachet of shabu. 5 from the pocket and 5 on top of the table. 10 sachets in all. Uh, weighing scale, aluminum fuel and strips. Section 12. No possession of paraphernalia. And then you have their illegal possession of firearm. Now, in illegal possession of firearm, it is a separate offense because it was not used as a means of committing a violation under section uh, under RA 9165. That's why it shall be filed separately. Is he qualified to avail of probation? Would he be qualified? Generally, no. Except if the for section 5, you have there um, not more than 1 gram. And then section 11, not more than 5 grams. Now, if you remember in probation, the most possible um, disqualification there is if you have their previous conviction. Now, take note, the, the accused here can be charged for four. The most practical way for him to do is to plead guilty to a lesser offense for all the four on the same day at the same time. And that would be considered as one conviction only for purposes of probation. No previous conviction. Okay, four in one day, that is considered to be one conviction for purposes of probation. Okay, so with that, I, I thank you for your time and study well.